Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring Carl Jung's Encounters with the dead. My guest is Stephanie Stevens, who has a doctoral degree in Jungian psychology. Between 2004 and 2013, she served on the executive committee of the International Association of Jungian Studies. Currently, she is a lecturer in counseling at the University of Canberra in Australia, where she is also a practicing psychotherapist. In addition, she is the recipient of the 2018 Francis P. Bolton Fellowship from the Parapsychology Foundation, and she is the author of C.G. Jung and the Dead, Visions, Active Imagination, and the Unconscious Terrain. This is my second interview with Stephanie. I'm going to link now to the first one because if you haven't already watched it, this interview will make much more sense to you if you watch that one first. Stephanie is in Australia, so now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Stephanie. I'm very happy to be with you once again. It's lovely to be with you too, Jeff. Thank you for having me. We're going to be digging into Jung's actual encounters uh, through visions, through dreams, but actually it's important, I think, to go right back to his work when he was still a doctoral student working on his dissertation. He wrote a dissertation on mediumship based on uh, sessions he attended. We discussed them briefly in our previous interview with his cousin, Helly Preiswerk. And uh, since you introduce Helly as a character, an, an important character later on in your book, I thought we would start there with his di doctoral dissertation. Yes. So um, here was Jung as a young uh, doctor at the um, psychiatric clinic at the Bergolzi, and he was doing rounds and he was observing uh, what so, psychiatric patients with psychiatric problems. But also he became became very interested in patients who were exhibiting non ordinary states of consciousness. Okay, where they appeared to be there but appeared dissociated. Okay, and seemed to be engaged in um, a focus that was not in uh, with him pre presently. He started making these comparisons between these types of psychiatric conditions and what he was seeing at home, you know, on a Saturday evening um, in the seances that he would attend with his mother and with his cousin. And it was his cousin in particular that really seemed to take his interest um, because she would go into the, she would have a ritual manner of going into a, a, a state of consciousness that allowed her um, to bring material, bring, be voice to what Jung would later uh, think to be the unconscious, that she was being voiced to the unconscious. And so he asked his supervisor at the hospital, would it be okay as a doctoral study if I kind of looked at uh, this kind of non-ordinary behavior? Now, they didn't call it non-ordinary. They called it, you know, psychiatric um, aberrations. Um, and so, you know, the, the supervisor said, yeah, go go for it. And so he did many observations of his, his cousin in this non-ordinary state of where she she was uh, visiting relatives and the relatives in a very spiritualist spiritualism framework, giving information back to the family. And Jung was fascinated by this, fascinated that human behavior could be so varied, okay, and its expression. And so um, in the end, with uh, anonymity, of course, um, he published this dissertation and concluded that basically that, you know, that this was a human behavior um, and that that mediums, in a sense, were very odd people. 
But what you want to contextualize with this is that, and, and I think we talked about this before, is that, you know, he observed this kind of dual behavior in his mother, you know, that he could walk into a room and see that she was in her other self, that she was present, but had a focus that was not in the room. And it started to concern him when he started observing this in himself. Um, but he, something that he was very clear about was that he felt it was non-pathological, that whatever was happening to him, whatever kind of two focus he was engaged in, it was not pathological. So yes, he published this dissertation. The cousin was always adamant. She said, you know, what, what's happening in this, these sessions when I'm doing this, you know, my not be provable, but that it's happening is absolutely positively the case. And so he took that into consideration when he was examining the data. Now, in your book, C.G. Jung and the Dead, you report numerous visionary and uh, dreamlike experiences that he had with the dead. And I want to get into a number of the specifics, but uh, let's jump towards the end of your book for a moment. Because you identify the, the same cousin, Helly Preisferk, who died, I think, about four years after he wrote his dissertation, as one of the dead that he encountered. And I know this is controversial. Not all Jungians are going to accept your interpretation. But as I recall, one of the reasons that you identified this figure as being Helly is because in his journals, the Red Book, he says that this person showed him the truth of the ancient Egyptian mysteries. And of course, the ancient Egyptians had very strong beliefs in the afterlife. Yes. So this figure appears. This is this is all amidst um, moving into the last part of the Red Book. Um, what would be considered, uh, you know, it, it's the section is called scrutinies. It is a large, larger. Well, not the largest book of the, the Red Book, but it includes embedded in it is seven sermons to the dead, but with much more expanded detail. And so we have Philemon in there, we have Jung in there, and then this figure appears. Now, what's interesting is that we have a formal ritual that occurs, which is a mass for the dead, so that Jung has almost been further initiated into being able to contact the dead and to go back and forth with them. And, and the point that I was trying to make is here is this figure who's assisting him to do this as she assisted him when she was alive. So she was a medium in life and she's a medium in death. And that by being there and teaching him perhaps how mediumship works on the other side or how mediumship works in the unconscious, she is representing what the Egyptian, uh, the ancient Egyptians understood the process of death to be. Yes. So I felt she was quite instrumental in that third part of the Red Book in assisting him to further engage with his dead. In the Red Book, where so many of these encounters occur, uh, death is something that comes up over and over and over again in many different contexts. For example, there, there are people who die in his visions, and uh, and and it's so he's a, he's actually watching uh, death occur in the visionary experiences. Exactly, exactly, and this makes it really fascinating. And and uh, Jeff, what I, what I would say is that you know when I went into the red book material, I had started my um, writing of my dissertation before the publication, and I was kind of building up some suppositions. And I said, and I said to my supervisor, I'll actually just be six more months because uh, I'm looking for something very specific. So after the book was published in 2009, I was just going to take these six months to, to follow follow this narrative thread of the dead. And in fact, it took me three years because just as you are describing so many encounters with the dead in very different, different ways. So, um, so, so yes, he, he, he's going into spaces where he's seeing uh, characters in the process of, of, 
you know, evolving from one state of being dead to another. Um, it raises questions of when you see um, a ghost in a dream, you know, is that ghost dead or is there an evolutionary process to being in the unconscious spaces? So, so yes, there's just so much material um, in, in that way. Now, Sorry, did I answer your question? Well, you know, we're going to jump around quite a bit, I think, Stephanie. Uh, it's such convoluted material. I don't necessarily expect straightforward answers. And, and I, uh, I think it's better to jump around a little bit. In, in the early part of the Red Book, I'm under the impression that he goes through a kind of uh, spiritual initiation in order to prepare him for his later contacts with the dead. And the, the spiritual initiation involves figures that I think are pretty clearly identified as aspects of his own psyche, his own unconscious mind, but they're very profound. Uh, one of them involves, and maybe you can explain this to me, uh, the death of Siegfried. Uh, I presume this is the hero of the Nibelungen, uh, the, the great uh, German uh, mythological cycle. Yes, yes. And Jung relates this one episode. He does um, deal with it in Memories, Dreams, and then it's greatly expanded in the Red Book. And what it, it, it seems to look to is that this, this psychic tension was really, really building up in his, you know, spirit of the times, if you will. And so when he's initiated, as you, you mentioned correctly, when he's initiated into this land of the dead, it, it enacts a... Um, just an explosion of content. Um, and it's, you know, dreams and journeys and um, activities and dates. And he's very aware of process. Okay. At the beginning of the book, of, of the Red Book, he's not necessarily knowing what he's doing. He's just going with it. By the time we get to this initiation, okay, when the spirit of the depths says, plunge to your depths and awaken your dead, as soon as he follows that instruction, then he is initiated into the deeper reaches of the unconscious, where all of this explosion of material occurs, right? And so by the time we get to Siegfried, the Siegfried episode, there is a lot of opinion that Jung is storing, okay, in terms of how he's feeling about this process, okay? What is happening to him? Okay, he knows that something is working on him. So when we get to the Siegfried episode, there's a great deal of psychic tension. And so suddenly we have this, this you know, um, episode where this great hero, okay, a great hero of Germanic culture is you know, laid waste on a battlefield. And after that, what seems to be made available to him is energy, psychic energy. So loosened up from that murder. Okay. It's a murder. All right. It's, it, it's not that the hero dies. It's that Jung feels he has been engaged in murdering a great hero. Now this is symbolic on all kinds of levels, isn't it? I mean, not only his Germanic ties with Freud and, and, and the psychoanalytic tradition at so far, um, and his, his professional circles, but also what he is learning by that death about the nature of the unconscious, which in a sense, he needs to leave Freud behind, right? He needs to embrace what he's learning about libido in the unconscious in order to have you know, petrol to move along to the next stage of the journey, if that makes sense. So it's a it's it's a very interesting liminal moment, right? Of of the book because it allows um, it is it allows him to somewhat leave his past behind, and it's not only a historical past; it's a dynamic past of the way he was applying his psychoanalytic understanding. So he's leaving that behind, and now it's rock and roll. Let's get going. <laughs> And as I recall, then uh, another major episode that comes uh, through is that he contacts two figures from his own subconscious. One is identified as Elijah the prophet, and the other is Salome, who is identified in this instance as Elijah's daughter, and I think is also identified as an anima figure for Jung. 
let me just say there is going to be a lot of, of uh, scholarship that's going to be produced around these two figures. They are, Jung felt they were seminal in representation and what he learned from each of them and, and, and so much great, you know, more expanded than they were obviously a memory stream. So um, I think what, uh, listen, I have to be honest, I grappled with these couple of passages for for a long time what is going on obviously there's symbolism here but if we take it literally that these two people just these two figures just might be the dead does this work or am i trying to pigeonhole something and in fact here salome is um this maiden and 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 see with as with anything with young should we take their historical names and the histor- historical representations that they may might be um, uh, trying to bring to Jung to to work through, or do we take them as personal figures for for um, Jung? And so, with Salome, you have this maiden. Of course, she's uh, uh, you know very famous for having, um, in a sense, been responsible for the murder of John the Baptist. That's one lineage of her name. Um, she was said to have danced, uh, you know, in front of King Herod, I believe. Um, and so she uh, also comes with a, a huge history um, in the um, 1920s. It was, she was kind of revived on, in, on the stage and revived in paintings. So there's this lineage that she has as a part of her name. What's interesting about Elijah, Elijah also a prophet. Now, isn't this important when we're talking about a timeless and spaceless place of the unconscious? What does it mean to have a prophet or someone who's able to see the future? Well, what's the future when you're in a timeless space? Perhaps it's the now. So perhaps Elijah is there to help Jung negotiate the now of the unconscious. Okay, so you have these two figures. um, And and by saying, uh, by Elijah saying, she is my daughter, you might be having a dynamic where Elijah, as an archetype of the prophet, has given birth to a figure of the unconscious that will help Jung work out an aspect of his journey so that he can work it back. What I want to say is that Elijah during these episodes does not seem to change at all, which might say that he is an archetypal figure that's timeless, you know, and Jung considers that. He's the wise old man who's come along to assist. And of course, later on, Jung uh, equivocates, I guess you'd say, um, Elijah with Philemon, and of course, with his number two personality. Right. So he doesn't seem to be changing in terms of the dialogue that Jung has with him now. But Salome is a very different story. And Salome starts to act very much what we would consider figures of the unconscious acting if they belong to our personality. The. uh fascinating episode occurs uh, because Salome is blind and, and, and you contrast her in a way with Elijah. He can see the future, but she's blind. And there, there's something of a dynamic between the two of them. But she asks Jung in this visionary act of imagination state to heal her blindness. And he does. And, and that seems to be a very important initiation for Jung. Absolutely, Jeff. Absolutely. This is a a very big turning point, okay? Because we have to keep in mind that up until the the Siegfried episode, there's a a passiveness about Jung. He's just kind of not understanding what's going on, but he has the commitment to understand it, right? And the commitment to hang in there. Then we get to Elijah and Salome, and he really starts thinking more actively about what is my role when I walk into the unconscious, into these spaces, and and things are already going on, what is my role still being alive and still being embodied when I go into these spaces? And so when when Salome asks for Jung to cl- to cure her blindness, this is a huge question. Okay, not only has Jung himself. Uh, uncovered a type of blindness in the unconscious and, and agreed to work with everything he's dealt with, everything that comes up, he's committed. But now he has a figure asking him to change something in that space. Okay. And so what's coming up for him is, oh my gosh, am I more engaged 
and active than I previously assumed I could be. And so you have this incredible ceremony that that kind of has resonance of the crucifixion. He assumes uh, the, you know, the um, Christ on the cross of posture, if you will, Salome kind of falls at his feet. And there's this very dramatic shift that occurs. And Jung initiates himself or gives himself permission to be engaged with her and to cure her blindness. And so what ends up happening is you have a lot of libido symbols, okay, around this. There's, you know, blood and there's there's liquids and sweating and, you know, um, washing of the feet, which is still resonant uh, uh, with her hair. Um, and so they're really strong Christian symbols. But at the end of the day, there's a shift of libido. Okay, there's this shift. And suddenly, he's able to cure her blindness and therefore loosen up some psychic energy, some psychic libido that he's able to use. And it allows her to evolve into a different type of figure. Now, I gather that in this visionary experience, he actually had the experience experience himself of being crucified on the cross, that he he was the crucified Christ. And as, as I recall, there's a footnote in your book that uh, suggests there may have been a, or may still be, uh, I've, I've heard rumors, uh, a cult of uh, Jungians who, who b- believe that Jung, in, in fact, uh, how can I put it? Jung, as, as Christ is viewed as God, so is Jung, that Jung became identified with the deity at that moment, according to some. Yes, and, and you're, you're quite right that there is a group that felt that, um, and I wouldn't say it's a group, I would say a few, uh, who felt that this, that Jung considered uh, this encounter to be that he was chosen to have this encounter. I would like to give Jung a little more credit um, around that. I feel that he very honestly um, and with dignity embraced this process for what it was, okay? And didn't really think that he was. I, I, I mean, whenever you have an encounter like this in the unconscious, the energy that comes back to you could be, you know, experienced as an inflation, what psycho- psychiatrists and psychologists, depth psychologists call inflation of the ego, because there is this boost of energy that comes back and it has to go somewhere in a sense of meaning, right? Um, but I would like to give Jung a little more credit. I think he realized something was important was happening. And I think he was able to work out in those episodes following what was important about that moment of himself going through that type of visceral sacrifice. Okay. He was in a sense, because it was so physical, the description of that episode of being in this uh, crucified posture um, what was he sacrificing in that moment? Was he sacrificing a very traditional acceptance of Christian values? Was he sacrificing in the same way as the Siegfried murder? Was he sacrificing a adherence to a framework that he almost couldn't bear anymore? He couldn't bear to practice uh, depth psychology in the way that Freud had insisted Right. And so this, you know, submitting himself to the sacrifice allowed him to learn more about himself and the unconscious in the end. So, um, again, I think we need to, you know, I, I. I have definitely read that that uh, uh, narr- narration of of a cult um, that Jung felt he was in a cult. Uh, I think his circles um, really admired him. Uh, his his followers really admired him and learned a great deal from him. But a cult status, uh, I don't think I'd buy that. Okay, but I'm under the impression it was after this uh, initiatory experience in his own act of imagination, the experience of being crucified as Christ, that then prepared him for contacts that you you describe as contacts with the actual dead. And uh, uh, after that, many things open up for him. And 
w- one episode I think would be e- interesting, and uh, I'm not sure I remember exactly how this is interpreted, but there's a lengthy dialogue with a an individual who was a poisoner, a murderer, and I'm under the impression correct me if i'm wrong that this this you identify this figure as, as a uh, a dead person yes it it would appear that um that the the poisoner is in the afterlife and he's in a specific kind of afterlife that he describes jung's very curious about it he's very curious tell me what it's like to be dead and and this this poisoner has literally nothing to say about it he other than there's just nothingness here occasionally i wonder about my family i wonder about other people i have seen other people i know here but basically it's nothing and so uh, that's a very, in, in some ways, it's a very interesting moment in the narrative because it, the Red Book is so active and involved and engaged in other places. Even um, there's the episode of the tramp yeah. where Jung is witnessing uh, uh, the process of someone dying and what would appear to be levels of the unconscious. So you have that experience earlier on in the red book. And then you have this experience where that, you know, you have this, this person who's obviously in a type of purgatory who has nothing to offer young, who's incredibly, incredibly interested in that state. And so some, some scholars might say, well, that that proves that the unconscious that in places that that's where we all go to a sense of nothingness and a, a state of not being conscious. But I don't think Jung really uh, went in that direction with it. Okay. I think he uh, felt I'm putting words in his mouth and thoughts in his head, but I think he, he sensed that, you know, the unconscious is all kinds of everything. And so you're going to find all kinds of um, beings and, and figures that have, themselves varying levels of of consciousness when they arrive to those spaces. In the Red Book, the dead appear to Jung in the context of these many visionary experiences uh, that he's having. But when I talk to people, as I do, who are mediums, who are spiritualists, and uh, uh, recently had a conversation shortly after our previous interview with, with a spiritualist medium, and I said, you know, Jung, suggests and and you concur that the dead live within the unconscious and he said well from the spiritualist perspective the dead see us living people as very unconscious and their life is much greater consciousness there many of them are in in heaven a, a really higher radiant uh, place where everything is more vivid and more beautiful and there's all sorts of guides and helpers and angels and wonderful things, but I gather that uh, none of that appears in the Red Book. Not in the ancient version of it. You're quite right. So, so the Virgilian version of a, 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 the um, Elysian fields and the hero section and the you know purgatory, no, or even in a Dante uh, Divine Comedy way, doesn't appear to be um, as such. Um, and, and what I'd like to say too is I, I would really like for, uh, us to get to a point in our conversation about this that it's not, uh, psychology and parapsychology, that the experience of the dead is not simply, um, you are making it up or my grandmother's standing in my bedroom. It's over there. I think we need, um, and, and, I think we need to evolve our um, definitions to say, in the first instance, parasite, there has been enough incidences um, and reports and examinations of what people would call parapsychological events to now consider them psychological events, okay, without um, dismissing any kind of third dimensional reality about it. Okay. Uh, and the reason I, I bring this up, and I think it's very important to start discussing is that in both instances, whether you consider the dead to be in my body, in my mind, or whether they're standing in my bedroom, the mechanism by which we experience both is the same. Okay, it, there, it, we are, uh, obviously, um, uh, 
built to have this type of sensory experience. So either way, I consider it a psychological experience. Now, whether the unconscious is in my body or the unconscious includes everything in my room um, is an ontological question that's very interesting. But for people who've had incredibly profound experiences, like you described, Jeff, last last conversation, you know, they are much less interested in the ontology of it. I mean, it becomes a very interesting question to engage in, but something profound has happened to and with them and has expanded their notion of who they are. Okay. And this is what happened to Jung. Again, Jung did not set off in the red book to look for the dead. He was not looking for that. What Jung was doing is having a very hard time in his life um, where he was an emotional, an emotional wreck. His life was not going in the direction he wanted. He was becoming more and more isolated. And so he knew he needed to do something in the process of this long journey. He keeps bumping into the dead. Right. And so I think that's also a very, very important point um, to, to, to say. And I think that, you know, when, you know, when we talk about, I saw a ghost and I um, have been engaging and discussing and sharing, you know, young questions in MDR, this great uh, quote that I'm just going to paraphrase, which is, you know, we don't know if the dead, when they show up, are representing something in ourselves or are representing something in themselves. OK, we we're unsure of that. But what we probably need to do is with our resources, get going and, and, and keep going. Right. Get going and keep going. So, again, I'm not sure if I landed on an answer for you. Let's circle around. Though, <laughs> it's, it's perfectly fine to, to jump around because we're dealing with material that is both complex and ambiguous. So. One of the themes that seems to run through the Red Book, I, I think of it as vampirism, actually, that uh, some of the dead that Jung encounters, uh, they want to relate to him, to connect with him, and they, they want to feed on his blood. And uh, this keeps this theme keeps recurring and I, I Jung seems both intrigued and disgusted at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought brought that up because blood um, is a, a, a is a libido symbol. Obviously, it, it uh, represents um, energy hidden in it. It, uh, you know, blood is probably the most specific um, reality of a human body. Right. And so this seems to be a currency within the the red book scenes where and and let's be let's remind ourselves of the scene in the odyssey when odysseus is trying to get a hold of his mother in ancient times rituals would be conducted and blood would be spilt in order so that could be a channel of connection between the dead and the living so Jung seems to be stumbling over this libido symbol of blood, and it appears to become us not only a um, cue that connection is going to happen, but this currency. OK, and so at first he is he's kind of, he's repulsed by it. But keep in mind, he at the beginning of the Red Book, the first kind of month, he's repulsed by an awful lot. He he is repulsed by the fact that he can't figure this out. There's a self repulsion. Also, do I have all these worlds inside of me? And I didn't even know it. Okay. So this, this blood asking seems to be occurring as a mode of making connection. And so in Jung's mind, it is the plug, if you will, right? The outlet and the plug. It allows the, the it's the dead's calling card, if you will, to say that they would like to connect with Jung. Now he gets to the point where he's seeing it as a sign, like, oh, this is happening, as opposed to, oh, you're trying to, you really do want my life force. Now, uh, in scrutinies, it becomes a, a, a little more high pitched, where they're asking because they are very hungry for their human experience again. Because keep in mind what, what you and I discussed last week, 
week is that, um, you know, the dead are trying to adjust in a, you know, formless, bodiless new space. And what they can remember appears to be the blood of their human existence. So that's what they, they connect with. You put it very delicately, I think, in your book that many women were enamored of, of Jung. And it, it's known, I think, at this point that he had a few affairs. And of course, he had uh, a, a long marriage with his wife, Emma. And uh, at one point, he describes how he, he encounters Emma after she dies and she is working. She's been working. She became an analyst herself and a student of Jungian thought and, and was working uh, before her death on uh, understanding the Grail legend. And Jung sees her after her death it, sort of very distant from him, not as approachable as some other women who had also died. But uh, Emma was still working on the Grail story. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's, there's real poetry in that, I feel, um, around her passing. And he, uh, details, um, how he himself experienced that passing. He, he was an old, old man by then. Um, and not, you know, not really retired at all, but just had slowed down. And he knew she was sick for a while. Um, and there's this very beautiful moment when he knows that she's passed and he talks about how the room actually changed, the feeling in the room changed. And this hidden secret was revealed to him about who she was. And so he experiences this passing of hers and also in a very visceral, physical way. And, um, you know, you could say that libido was passed back on to him from that release. And when he becomes very more interested in this idea of uh, post-mortem existence. He appears to go looking for her in the unconscious, can't find her. He has a dream about her um, where she appears re almost in this regal state in, in a dress that actually Heli, his cousin, made for her. Um, and so there's that beautiful connection. And it, she seems to be, as he describes, well, how he describes it is that um, there seems to be no projection at all. Um, so, and, and we're left to wonder if he's talking that there's no projection from him and he's able, to, therefore, to see her in this splendor of unattached uh, wholeness, if you will, or if it's she who's individuated to the point where she has no projections. He's left that unidentified. And I think that's very beautiful, too, because he says in more more than one place, you know, this is my work. This is my prima materia. These are my gods. These are my demons. You have to, you know, contend with your own. But this is just what I've been through. So, so yes. And then he he had a dream about Tony Wolf. Now, Tony Wolf, was, he had a very, very long relationship with Tony Wolf. And, and people have written about how difficult the three of them managed their interpersonal relationship personally and professionally being a part of the psychoanalytic community. And Tony Wolf um, really helped him through, you know, the hardest part of his confrontation with the unconscious. We don't know exactly what happened during those Wednesdays and Sundays when they met, um, but we do know that she assisted him with working through the material as he was experiencing it. OK, it, a side note that people often mention is that Tony Wolf herself could not practice active imagination, which is also very interesting. Is it that she was, in a sense, um, so centered, OK, uh, or so in touch with her own psyche that enabled her to venture into Jung's material in such an intimate way? Um, so so, yes. So when he had this some. Um, dream of Tony Wolf after she passed, keeping in mind it was a, that her death was a real shock to him. He was surprised that she passed and he felt that certainly he would have had a sign or would have known. So that's very interesting. But he has this dream of her after she dies. And she's as he I think he describes it as she's much closer to earth 
we're much closer to being able to return to Earth. And I think that's a very interesting open-ended experience in the way that he's described it. So yes, from those two post-mortem kind of experiences, he seems to be indicating to us not only that the unconscious is a venue for the dead, but there are different neighborhoods, right? And 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 he speculates as to why you would be like the poisoner in a place that has a nothingness or in these other places with people who he do, does know in places that feel richer in experience. There's the suggestion, as I recall in your book, that because Tony Wolf is closer to the earth that she m might reincarnate, although I, I don't know that Jung goes into that very much. No, he doesn't. But but there are you know sentences like that, Jeff, that that seem to indicate that he thought very very closely uh, about reincarnation. And there is this one episode in the Red Book with Philemon and being on the wheel of existence, and he watches Philemon step off of that wheel. And there does seem to be this moment where um, there you know could in fact. The unconscious also hold a key to the ideas of rebirth that the Eastern religions have. And so he does kind of walk through that, but he never really lands, just like you're saying, he never really lands on how he feels about reincarnation. He doesn't. Um, Roger Wolger, who it was a, a very um, well-known Jungian, who, who was very uh, interested in Jung's opinions about the afterlife, He's he wrote a book that kind of explored this and, and tried to tease out. This was pre-read book, though. So tried to tease out some ideas around that. Yeah, I've met Roger and he's, he also became a past life therapist. He did. He did. So he he was like perfect to write a book about what, what do we think um, in terms of uh, where does Jung stand? And Jung never really committed, although he did say, you know, I feel convinced that when the soul leaves the body, that it's alive for a time. But how long that time is, I can't tell. So we have him saying that. As I recall, there was also a, a discussion based on a lecture he gave to the Society for Psychical Research in which he distinguishes between the soul of a living person and the spirit of, of the departed. And he speculates that perhaps the spirit of the departed is, is not the entire soul, but a, a fragment of the soul. Yes. And, and uh, yes. And, um, you know, he tries very hard to, while he's moving forward with some of these ideas, not to say something that ends up discounting his whole theory of archetypes, right? I mean, there's a wonderful uh, grappling that we see when he tries to explain to, to someone who wrote him a letter, explain the difference between an archetype and a spirit, a spirit who's um, dead. And he just goes back and forth, you know, perhaps the archetype coalesces, you know, archetypes, in fact, act a lot like spirits of the dead. Um, could it be uh, uh, what you're talking about, Jeff, in terms of a part of the, the soul, the spirit could be an ancestral inheritance? Yes, he goes, he, he tries very hard to create new conceptual language that assists him and doesn't cul-de-sac him, if you will. And, and you can see him struggling along at times with that. But yes, he, he was thinking, you know, what could some, you know, when I dream about my deceased father, is it him? Or is it an ancestral trace? Um, is it what's an ancestral trace in relation to an archetype, you know, it has an archetype um, walked into my dream space and is symbolizing something. So you can imagine this was a lifelong, you know, thought question <laughs> for for young well, and he's such a pioneer and such an explorer willing to consider ideas that most people wouldn't even uh, address at all. Uh, but I'd like to go back to the death of his wife, Emma. 
it seems as if uh, the suggestion is that after her death, she's working on the Grail story and she's still engaged further in the process of individuation, which is, I think, different than some of the other dead he encountered that seems stuck in, in whatever psychic space they were in at the moment of their death. But Emma, he describes, if I recall correctly, as having uh, no projections and no earthly ties. Like she is now ready to move on to an, another higher space. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and yes, that that image of her continuing her research from from one plane to another. That that almost as if what she was preparing to understand the Grail symbolically and historically, and then by moving into this other space. Um, the disembodied space, she is reconnecting with grail material that allows her to understand it on that side as well. Almost as if Heli, you know, her, her mediumship on, on earthly side needed to be reinforced or enacted on uh, the disembodied side, the dead side. And so if we are to take the grail as a symbol or, you know, it, it, the cup of understanding mortality and how it arose as an important symbol in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, in the Middle Ages of being the symbol of knowledge and wisdom, then in fact, it, it's a it's very poetic, isn't it, that she would work on the volume and then be living uh, her concept uh, on the other side. The fact that she understood perhaps what, you know, dropping all projections meant um, while she was studying the grail and while she was living with a man who was trying to work out what that meant um, in his, with his patience, right? Um, how much do projections cause, uh, you know, dis-ease, right? And so, it, yes, a, a beautiful image of her on the other side, continuing individuation. And, and this is another very interesting question, Jeff, this idea of, you know, do we continue growing, uh, all things being equal? And if you think of an afterlife, do we continue to learn and grow on the other side? And Jung takes this up, and so does the um, a Jungian analyst named Susan Olson. She's wrote very movingly about uh, about these questions and about the death of her daughter, some of the clues that she got before her daughter's passing. And she questions and looks at dreams to consider, is this a sign that the soul is actually continuing learning? And so Jung seems to fall in this place, having seen his wife pass in this way um, and dream about her after her passing. He seems to fall in this space of, well, they do con continue learning, but it's learning in a different way. It's learning not earthly facts, but it's learning what our um, poor dead in scrutinies are trying to do, learning the, you know, vastness of the unconscious, how to live in that space and how to learn from that space um, while not pleading for blood and sucking sucking and knocking and saying, paying attention to us um, for the time. And so these are in really important questions, aren't they? You know, do we continue to learn and grow if we don't have a body? And Jung thought a long time about that. Well, Stephanie Stevens, what a wonderful conversation this has been. I am so thrilled to be able to share your insights with our viewers. Uh, I feel uh, very excited by the possibilities here. And I know, for example, that you, you see a lot of potential for the psychotherapeutic uh, growth that can come out of the recognition that, that people can have actual contact with the dead. Yes, yes. Um, and, and of course, the Connecting Bonds research by uh, class is, is another uh, very interesting space of research that's evolved, that it seems that, that people are more comforted, that we have a natural propensity to continue our relationships with our deceased members of our family, extended family. And that seems to be a more healing space to be meeting grief than the getting used to loss. 
Yes. And so I think a, a more involved conversation around that. And I know people in different spots are, are, are working on that to, to raise the possibility that there could be a protocol that would be a healing protocol if people were open to it. Right. So. Well, that would be a wonderful topic for a future interview. As a matter of fact, let's, let's give that some thought. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for being with me. Thank you so much, Jeff. I've really enjoyed being here. Thank you for the invitation. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.